Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillah, it's a great pleasure uh, and honor to be among you, all dear brothers and sisters all over the country and uh, other uh, parts of the world. Uh, it's, uh, alhamdulillah, great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon me and upon all of us to have this opportunity to go through different verses of his book and try to understand uh, the verses that are uh, selected for uh, this webinar is uh, the last few verses or the last few verses of Surah Al-Hajj, Surah number 22 of Quran, uh, verses uh, 73 to 78. 73 to 78, uh, these are the verses that we are going to talk about. Although the verses are kind of loaded and just a couple of them would have been enough for this kind of session. But inshallah, we will try to be as brief as possible and then try to cover some other points and, and the questions and answers. So we'll go inshallah for about half an hour or so and then we'll have time for question and answer. Uh, the first verse in this set is verse number 73 that you may see on the screen also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytuan ar-rajim, bismillahi rahman ar-rahim. يا أيها الناس ضرب مثل فاستمعوا له. O people, O human beings. Quran is the only book that addresses the whole humanity. And there are many verses that Allah starts with يا أيها الناس, O humanity. A parable has been cited, an example has been given. A parable is being said here. Then listen to it. And is like, listen to it carefully. Basically, give your mind and heart to it. Give your attention to it. For this parable that Allah has cited. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ لَنْ يَخْلُقُوا ذُبَابًا وَلَا وَجْتَمَعُوا لَهِ Indeed, all of those things and, or those creatures or those people that people call upon other than Allah or people depend on other than Allah, they are not able to create a fly. Uh, fly they cannot create the Baba. Wala which tamaula, even if all of them collaborate and get together and they uh, work together to create just a fly, they cannot do so. Here, uh, before I uh, talk about the rest of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives uh, an example to make the point. You know, there are many, many places in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives examples. And one of the methods of communication is to give examples as teachers, you know, uh, uh, teachers usually give the examples, people who try to make their, the parents want to help their children to understand things. They give them examples and they give them parables. So parables is a, a device for communication to help people understand. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives some very powerful parables to make things clear, to make the point for people, in case people people do not get the abstract ideas and teachings and instructions. So Allah here gives a very powerful and profound example. And Allah says that, listen to this parable, that those people, uh, the people who call, the people who call others other than Allah, meaning that they worship others other than Allah, or they depend on others other than Allah, or they uh, ask for help from others other than Allah, these people and those uh, things or objects that they worship or depend on, they cannot even create a fly. A fly, if we think about it, when, you, when we all uh, think about it, it's one of the simplest kind of 
creatures uh, that people may not even want to think about it. People may not even consider it much, a fly. But as, as small as a fly and as a simple creature as a fly, that uh, human beings or any other uh, uh, things or uh, deities that people take as object of worship, Allah says, they cannot even create that small, simple creature that uh, uh, like a fly. And beyond not being able to create it, Allah says that the remaining of the verse, and if this fly snatches something from them, they cannot even release it back. They cannot even get it back. Meaning, if you have some food in front of you or some uh, thing else in front of you and this fly comes, and picks a bit of it, you know, you cannot get that thing back. The power of human beings are yes, demonstrated that how powerless human beings or all other entities are uh, that uh, people want to worship because not only they cannot create a fly, but they cannot even control the fly. They cannot even get something back from the fly and there are some, uh, you know, scientific studies about the fly that, that the fly has the fastest digestive system. That as soon as the fly picks up something, it digests it right away instantly. So that describes uh, also the uh, special ability of uh, a fly that how people cannot get it back if the fly, you know, wants to take something away from people. And then Allah says. Both sides have been defeated, basically. The seeker and the sought, the pursuer and the pursuit, the one who invoked and the one who was invoked. Both of them are helpless and powerless. Meaning that the people who depend on these other entities other than Allah, they are so weak themselves and those entities that they depend on them they are so weak that they cannot do anything just look at the example of creation of, of a, a fly that they cannot make and even they cannot control the fly and they are not under their power if the fly takes something and then Allah says, مَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَقَوِيٌّ عَزِيز Then it's verse, verse 74. That Allah says that indeed people have not valued Allah as he should be valued. People have not esteemed Allah as Allah should be esteemed. And indeed Allah is almighty and all-powerful. This is the reality that people who turn to others other than Allah, people worship other things or other people or other uh, you know, entities other than Allah. The problem is that they have not recognized Allah. They have not really understood who Allah is. If they really understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would never do so. You know, Lack of proper knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the history have been the cause of a lot of different kinds of shirk, different kinds of associations with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People have been overwhelmed and impressed by others, by other individuals, by, by themselves, by other things. When they see something happening transcendent in their eyes or something a little powerful, they get oh, so overwhelmed. For example, if they look at the sun and the moon and they say, oh, the sun is so powerful that light of the sun and the heat of the sun is basically so important for us that if, if the sun doesn't exist, then we cannot uh, be alive on the earth. So they started worshiping the sun. If they looked at the fire and they said fire is so powerful and strong, they started firing the power. If they saw some individuals who showed some miracles or who showed some, you know, uh, uh, work of uh, magic or anything, you know, People got so impressed that they started worshipping those individuals 
or those uh, prophets of Allah that they brought some miracles with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so all of this is because of lack of proper knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of not understanding the value of who Allah is. Because when they associate somebody else with Allah, it means that they think that Allah cannot do himself something. They think that somebody else can play a role of a, uh, intercessor between us and Allah. So if we worship this, then the, the day of judgment, these uh, uh, objects of worship will save us and, uh, from uh, the hellfire and from punishment. They think that, uh, you know, these entities uh, can uh, bring some uh, good fortunes for us in this life. You know, all of this because they do not know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah is the only power of the universe who is independent, who is their creator. Everything else is dependent on him. Everything else are created by him. Everything else takes their lives and existence from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no one has any kind of power of intercession or any kind of partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and unless Allah gives intercession to some individuals himself. So how could people, you know, worship something else or somebody else? This really shows their jahal, their ignorance, their lack of knowledge about Allah when they associate other things about Allah or with Allah or they uh, worship something something instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains two of those uh, uh, deities that people usually have taken throughout the history as object of worship instead of Allah who are the uh, angels and messengers, and Allah talks about them. Allah has chosen messengers from angels and from humanity, people. So from amongst uh, angels, there are some of them like Jibreel salam, who is a messenger who brings the message. And there are some human beings like Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and other prophets who are in, in selected to bring the message as a messenger. So Allah says he has chosen these messengers. So Allah out of all those different uh, uh, objects of worship mentions these two that people throughout the history they have started worshiping. Some people as, as have started uh, worshiped uh, angels throughout the history, the Arabs during the time of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and they were thinking that angels are daughters of Allah. So they were worshiping angels and they were imagining the form of an angel and they would make a statue, an idol of an angel and put it in the house and they would worship and they feel that, okay, someday these angels will intercede uh, on our behalf. And also here uh, 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 among the prophets, among the human beings, as we know, you know, uh, people have ascribed uh, uh, Godhead to Prophets such as uh, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, peace be upon him, that they have taken him as son of God or worshipped him on, or Uzair in the history of Jewish, that they taken as son of God. Uh, and so they took human beings as such uh, partners or intercessors or family members of God. You know, they ascribed family relations to Allah and they started worshipping these human beings. So Allah talks about these two that look among all those different deities, Think about these two the, uh, kinds of uh, things that people have taken as deities from human beings and from the angels. You know, in Allah Samiun Basir, Allah is the one who is monitoring basically these human beings, messengers, and angel messengers. And Allah is the one who listens to them what they are doing and is watching them what they are doing. So even those human be those prophets and those messengers, they are under the monitoring and control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And beyond that, they, uh, Allah has knowledge about their future and about their past, and everything eventually will be turned to Allah eventually. Meaning that even these uh, messengers and these uh, angels who have the highest a status with Allah, you know, among all the creation that Allah has created, uh, 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 living and non-living creatures, especially among living creatures, the highest status among creation that has is the messengers of Allah and the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
even these uh, angels and human beings that are selected as prophets, they are so weak in front of Allah that they do not even know what is going to happen in their lives a few minutes later or what's going to, uh, you know, uh, about their past. They would not remember a lot of things that they would not know. You know, Allah has their full knowledge of their future and their life. And eventually all those actions that the prophets have done and the reactions that people have shown towards the prophet, eventually all of them will go back to Allah and Allah will take the, the prophets and people into account. And so, you know, eventually if the people do not listen to the prophets, the prophets will not be responsible. Uh, those people will be responsible. And no matter what kind of excuses they bring up, eventually they will pay for their excuses. So, you know, they better understand that no one, uh, no one is worthy of worship, no one is worthy of servitude, and everybody should really worship Allah alone. He is the only one who is the creator. He is the only one who has the power. He is the only one who uh, is to be feared and to be obeyed unconditionally and to be uh, worshipped. So uh, it, with this uh, powerful parable, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts addressing the believers in the next couple verses. And this next couple of verses, we can say that it's the conclusion of the whole surah, surah al Hajj. The whole surah concludes with these two verses, which are very profound remarks and addressing the believers with their special responsibilities that what they should do in order to face all these trials and difficulties and hardships that uh, these believers bring to them sometimes or to uh, meet the challenges and to fulfill the uh, duties that uh, they are supposed to do. So Allah addresses in these two verses. And the first verse in verse 77, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu ruka'u wasjudu wa'budu wa'budu rabbakum wa'f'alu al-khayra la'allakum tuflihu. Oh, believers, oh, those who have believed, those who have attained to faith. Those belief is the most important element of life. The best accomplishment of a human being is to have belief in the truth. And so Allah addresses you, uh, believers with their best accomplishment. Oh, believers, bow down in front of your Rabb, bow down and prostrate and serve your Rabb and be slave of your Rabb and worship your Rabb. So Ruku and Sajda that are mentioned here are the two main parts of the Salat, of the daily prayers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that basically, you know, offer your prayer as an as, and, uh, ruku and sajda is basically also the symbols of all other acts of worship, that worship your creator, your Rabb, the one who has created you, the one who has taken care of you all along your life, the one who has provided for you, the one who owns you. That, these are all the different meanings of Rabb. Allah says that, bow down in front of your Rabb is only worthy of it. And prostrate in front of him, basically offer all acts of worship only to him. وَعْبُدُوا رَبَّكُمْ And offer servitude to your Rabb. Servitude here is basically obedience that obey of your Rabb, obey the rulings and the orders. So other than the acts of worship, and everything else that your Rabb asks you to do, go ahead and do that. Offer servitude in every aspect of your life, in your personal affairs, in your family affairs, in your social affairs, in your political affairs, in your economic affairs. So worship your Rabb. Wafalul Khaira and do the good. Wafalul Khair. Here basically includes all kinds of khair, all kinds of good deeds. So Islam does not limit people only to just some famous acts of worship, 
but anything that is good. And what is the definition of a good deed in Islam? The definition of a good deed is any deed that is pleasing to Allah. Any deed that is any action that's pleasing to Allah, that's a good deed. So do anything that is good in the society that's pleasing to Allah. That's good. Do anything good in the family. Good anything deed, good to yourself that's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are some special commands to the believers, to the Muslims that uh, you should, uh, oh believers, you should worship Allah alone, that he deserves your worship and he is, and he is your Rabb. Just tell the word Rabb explains all the, uh, you know, uh, special qualifications that Allah is only the Rabb and do all the kind of good deeds for him. Why? Perchance you become successful, perchance you achieve success or so that you achieve success. Success is the goal of every human being. Everybody wants to become successful in life. And success is usually the accomplishment of objectives. When people set goals and objectives, when they achieve those goals and objectives, then they say, I'm successful. But the real success is the success for goals and objectives that the creator of this universe has set for human beings. Allah, our creator, who has created us, the goals and objectives that he has set for us, that if we try to achieve that, then we are successful. And for the word success, Quran uses two different words, falah and fawz. What is the difference between falah and fawz? Falah is the success in this world in terms of investing our resources to the pleasure of Allah. So the more we invest our time, our other resources, our energy, our talents, our education to please Allah, that is success. Even though we may not see the results, we're still successful from Allah's point of view. And then when, you, uh, when we achieve the final success in the next life, that is fouls that we will achieve, inshallah, the pleasure of Allah and Jannah in the next world. That is the triumph achievement, the, the final success. So Allah says, in order to succeed, you guys, believers, should be doing that. Then moving to the last verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues and addresses the believers and says, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَ جِهَادِ And strive in the path of Allah as it should be strived, as it is due for him to be strived. The striving in the path of Allah, the word jihad has a very comprehensive meaning. Jihad includes all kinds of efforts that human beings should make at their highest potential to please Allah, in the path of Allah, to seek his approval. Jihad is exerting our best efforts and putting our highest potential in the path of Allah. In anything, including the armed struggle forms of jihad, but that's the last resort that if everything else fails and people attack you and you have to defend yourself, but otherwise you uh, uh, use all other forms of jihad by your pen, by your hand, by your tongue, by you know all those other kind of intellectual jihads uh, for the truth and against the disbelievers who try to make the truth fail. So Allah says, do the jihad as you're supposed to, as it is expected from you believers. Allah is the one who has chosen you. Allah has chosen you, has selected you, the ummah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the best, as the flag bearers of the truth on the earth after the advent of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This leadership was given to others before, 
But now, after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is given to the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we are all responsible for this, that Allah has chosen us for that job, that mission, that we share the message of Allah with others, and we take all the uh, you know, sacrifices in this path and accept this, uh, this struggle, and we make the promise to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala based on that Allah has chosen. وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ And then Allah says that Allah has not made the affairs of the deen for you difficult and Allah has not put hardship for you in the deen. Meaning that in spite of the fact that Allah has chosen you out of all humanity and you are expected to do so much but Allah has not put any kind of hardships on you and Allah in this deen he has made things easy for you meaning that this deen first of all in terms of beliefs and in terms of principles when you think about it it's very clear and straightforward it doesn't confuse you it doesn't make it difficult for you to understand this deen from belief point of view and then from actions point of view this deen is basically expecting you to do things that are kind of natural tendencies for human beings. You know, for example, daily prayers. Every human being wants to, you know, relate to a higher power and uh, worship a higher power. But the problem of most of the human beings is that they misidentify this higher power. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that, you know, this uh, Allah has given us this institution of salah daily prayers that five daily prayers that when we offer it fulfills th that natural tendency of of human beings to relate to a higher power and to communicate and to depend and to ask for guidance and all of these things that offer so it's a natural thing it is not too much for, from you to ask you to pray five times a day this deen is based on your fitra based on your innate nature based on your original nature you, you're not expected to do something out of ordinary you know zakat hajj other actions that Allah has asked us, these are not too much if, you, if we really think about it, if we are honest about it. Only if some people are not used to these things and they have lived in environments where they have, uh, you know, not practiced Islam at all, or then Islam sounds kind of too much for them, or some teachings of Islam sound too, re, uh, restri too much restrictions. But if we really think about it, it's not. So Allah says there is no haraj, there is no hardship in this deen and many places and uh, other places we don't have time to give references to other verses of Quran. Allah has chosen you for what? For the path of your father Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah has called Ibrahim alayhi salam our father. Ibrahim alayhi salam is the one who established the model of Tawheed, the model of oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was an ideal Muslim once because he, he developed his faith and belief using a rational approach when he looked at the universe and the heavens and the earth and he finally concluded that only the creator of this universe is worthy of my worship and my obedience. Then after that, he gave all of his life and offered all kinds of sacrifices and he really showed us what a Muslim means and uh, uh, that how much sacrifices we should do in the path of Allah and how much we should love Allah more than love of our children and love of everything else and everybody else. So Allah says now, your path is the path of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the word Milla is very beautiful. It is uh, basically the, the paradigms, the principles, the, the, the value system that Ibrahim alayhi salam had, the ideology that Ibrahim alayhi salam had, that is uh, for us. And Allah says that Allah gave you an identity and that identity is a name for you to be a Muslim. He named you Muslims, subhanAllah. The word, the name of religion in Islam and the name of Muslims do not come from a tribe, from a prophet name, does not come from a, a, a country or a place like other religions. All other religions are named based on these kind of things 
But Islam is the only religion that the name of Islam is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah says, وَرَبِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ And I have chosen Islam for you as a deen. And here says, هُوَ سَمَّاكُمُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ He called you Muslims. So your identity is given by your Rabb, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Muslim means something very valuable. Why? Because Ibrahim السلام, was Muslim and all other prophets were Muslims. Every prophet from Adam السلام, to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa were Muslims in terms of uh, beliefs and in terms of faith and, and in terms of meaning that they are all surrendering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala their will. And Allah says, he called you Muslims من قبل وفي هذا. In the past, he has called you Muslims. All those sincere followers of every prophet have been called Muslims. And in this Quran, you have been called as Muslims. لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ وَتَكُونُ شُهَدَاء عَلَى النَّاسِ So that the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a witness on all of you and you, all of you, are witnesses on the rest of mankind. SubhanAllah. Being a witness. The messenger was a witness among us, meaning that the messenger lived a lifestyle that if when you study his life, if you were around there, them, him at that time, or even now when you study his life, you can easily say that he was a witness of the truth. He lived the truth. He, was, he embodied the truth. He really exemplified the truth and he taught the truth. The same way you guys should live an example, exemplary life for the rest of humanity. That when the rest of the humanity looks at Muslims and the Muslim Ummah, they should say that, wow, we want to follow this. These are really the witnesses of truth. That's the kind of responsibility that is being put on the shoulder of the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. فَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ And then Allah gives them a specific orders. Of course, there's much more to explain about these verses, but I'm trying to be brief so I can finish in another, inshallah, five minutes. فَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ then establish the prayers, Salat, and give the Zakah. Many places in the Quran, Allah, out of different kinds of commands and different kinds of acts of worship, Allah usually uses these two as examples. Salat and Zakat. Just like from different uh, uh, faculties and organs that we have, Allah usually uses the vision and the uh, Sama and Basar the hearing and the vision. So the same thing in other acts of worship. This, these two are chosen. Why? Because these two are uh, symbols of all other uh, commands. That Salat is establishing the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Salat is really also uh, teaches you the uh, social system, the political system of uh, Islam, that how Muslims should offer the Salah in Jama'ah, the same way that you know the leader should be elected and not... Uh, Force and many other things related to Salah that should be used in political system and Muslims should learn order and hierarchy and should learn uh, uh, you know, the process and a system of life just like they offer the prayers from that and Zakat that they should take care of the needy and the poor and the, the people of disadvantage in the society. All of this, uh, you, you should take care of it. Take care of the creation of Allah and take care of your responsibilities towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hold fast to the to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the path of Allah, to the rope of Allah. And stick fast. Basically, improve your relationship with Allah. Make your relationship with Allah strong. And depend on Allah all the time. And try to always seek pleasure of Him. Always fear of Him alone. Always depend on him alone. Always ask things from him. That's it. That is the kind of fasting that you are holding that you should do to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Get your energy and strength from there. Anytime you have difficulty, turn to him. Because he is your mawla. Mawla can mean a patron, a guardian, a helper, a protector. Is the true Mawla. No one can be the, that kind of Mawla other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fani'am al Mawla, Fani'am al Nasir. What an excellent Mawla! What an excellent helper! What an excellent guardian! What an excellent 
helpers who helps if not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarizes many things for Muslims, believers, and for humanity in general. And Allah tells basically believers that establish your own personalities, build your own personalities as true believers, and establish Islam in the society, and establish Islam around you, and make the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the deen of life, the deen of the system of life around you, the iqamat deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is not enough to be a good Muslim for yourself, but be a good Muslim for the humanity and for the society. There's much more to cover, but inshallah, I'll stop here so we can have some time for questions and answers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from all of us and help us to reflect and understand and, and think more deeply, inshallah. The, the question is the question I, that I, some I, people I, say that uh, Allah is too busy uh, and how we can take care of everything and how we can uh, pay attention to every detail of everybody's life, that uh, the verse says that everything is returned to Allah, everything is uh, referred to Allah. Uh, see, uh, what we need to uh, understand about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, the fact that Allah has, Allah's nature is infinite, infinity, and Allah's attributes are all infinite. Meaning that Allah has infinite amount of knowledge, infinite amount of power, infinite amount of wisdom, if infinite amount of capabilities. So once we understand this concept of infinity about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we would get out of these human limitations uh, that we usually think of our own uh, capabilities. You know, for example, human beings can talk only to a few people at a time. Human beings can see so much. Human beings can uh, hear so much uh, sound. So everything about us, about angels, about uh, other creatures are, are finite. We are finite creatures and we have limitations. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is infinite. Infinite meaning that, you know, there is no limit for him. In fact, the word subhanallah, every time we say subhanallah, one of the meanings of subhanallah is that Allah is infinite. Allah has no limit. Allah has no shortcomings, no weaknesses. Allah is free from all of that. That Allah can talk to millions of people at the same time. Allah can respond to the supplications of millions of people at the same time. In the day of judgment, Allah is sariul hisab that Allah can take account of millions of people at the same time. So all everything that Allah does is based on this infinity and infinite capabilities. So once we understand this concept of infinity about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it becomes easier for us to understand the work of Allah, that how Allah can do so many things and can uh, hear so many people's supplication at the same time and respond to all of them. And Allah does not get uh, distracted by one or the other. And uh, all, every little and uh, big detail of our life is uh, tracked by him and monitored by him. And so uh, as trillions of other creatures are tracked by Allah and monitored by Allah, and Allah has infinite amount of visibility, uh, uh, vision ability, and, and hearing ability, there is no limit for him, okay? That, inshallah, will help us to understand the powers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm getting some questions through text also. Uh, one question says, what are some practical ways to fulfill the responsibility of being witnesses to humanity? Very good, beautiful question. What are some practical ways to fulfill the responsibility of being witnesses to humanity? You know, as the Ummah of uh, Islam that Allah has chosen us, indeed, we have lots of responsibilities. We need to first understand the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly. We need to understand Allah himself properly. We need to understand the teachings of Allah and the book of Allah and the teachings of his prophet So we have to increase our knowledge. That's one of the main responsibilities. And then 
we need to apply this knowledge on ourselves, embody them so that we can understand by practicing it that what does it mean, what Allah says. You know, no matter how much we talk about Salat, 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 prayer, 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 but if we don't offer the Salat, we don't even have, get an idea what Salat is all about. When we offer the Salat and we see the enjoyment of it, we see the, the, the great peace and happiness that we achieve, then we can really explain with some passion to other people about Salat and talk about it and help other people to offer the Salat. Mm -hmm. So we have to apply the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the next responsibility. And then even applying the, mas the message to ourselves is not enough, but we need to share the message and we need to go forward and do so. And if we don't do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath in the shortest surah of Quran, Wal Asr, that Allah says basically it takes an oath with the time that people are going to be losers in the day of judgment, except the people who have four characteristics. The first two, Iman and Amal Salih, that usually Quran just mentions those two as the required ones to enter Jannah. But here Allah emphasizes on two other attributes that says what tawasaw bil haq, what tawasaw bil sabr. That everybody should really do tawasaw bil haq and tawasaw bil sabr. That basically share the truth, advise the truth, and promote the truth, and also advise people towards patience and perseverance so that they don't give up. So this is the next responsibility to share the message that Allah has chosen us or chosen the believers throughout the history. Ibrahim salam was chosen. The children of Ibrahim salam were chosen, Ismail and Ishaq. And then the followers of Ismail salam at some point, they became idol worshippers and statue worshippers. The, uh, the descendants the descendants of Ismail salam, the descendants of Ishaq salam eventually started to worship a prophet, a messenger, and they started to worship Holy Ghost and others. You know, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us and, and, you know, pass this responsibility to the Ummah of Prophet وسلم, Muhammad وسلم, and, and say that now you're the chosen servants, now you guys uh, should do the job. So that is, you know, books can be written about this, that what are the kind of responsibilities that we should do and how we should truly become exemplary human beings, the best human beings, the most, uh, excellent human beings, you know, excellence in our lives, in our personal lives, in our family lives, in our social lives, in all other aspects of life. And we should really uh, uh, be the most helpful people, the most beneficial people in the, in the society, uh, the most honest people, the most truthful people, the most sincere people. And, you know, we should develop all these great, great habits and great qualities in such a level that people can be can see us as witnesses of truth and the best witnesses are start with our you know family members can our family members say that yes my father my mother my brother my son or my children uh, is really a great muslim a good muslim can say can they say that can are they the witnesses and then our relatives the other circles that we are involved our in our job in our workplaces the people who are around us, do they see us as a witness of truth? In our neighborhoods, do they see us as a witness of truth? Do we really take our time to establish a relationship with our neighbors and help them and be kind to them and, and you know, uh, uh, do some basic things such as shoveling their snow sometimes or taking their trash or helping them in their uh, grocery? You know, it's, it's small things like that. And the same thing in our workplaces and in our jobs and the same thing in the society in general. Do we do that? Do we really show that we are witnesses of the truth? But beyond these little things, you know, and, and major things, do we really share that the truth, the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we really proud of this message? Are we really proud in the positive meaning of it that we feel confident about it and we are going out and sharing it? So this is the responsibility of da'wah, that alhamdulillah, you know, Allah has given us this message and this message should not, should not be kept to, our, to us. But each one of us should be active in sharing this message with other people and helping other people understand who Allah is. What is this final message? What is this real message? What is uh, the teachings of his uh, prophet? So there are so many other things that uh, we can go on and on 
that inshallah we have to reflect on this. Uh, the next question, how do names of Allah mentioned in these verses related with each other? So uh, the question is about the names of Allah mentioned in these verses that how they are related with each other. So there are several names that Allah has mentioned here about himself. Uh, some of the names were uh, that Allah is uh, Sami, Allah is Basir, uh, Allah is uh, Nasir, Allah is Mawla. You know, so if we just look at these four names, so Sami and Basir, that Allah is hearing everybody and everything. And basically, whatever we say, even if our souls whisper within us, Allah hears it. Nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that is said in the heavens or in the earth, Allah knows it. And he is Sabiul uh, Alim in uh, one place that Allah is hearing and knows everything. So Sami, that Allah is Sami, and if we understand this attribute of Allah, that Allah is Sami, then we would be extra careful in what we say and what we really uh, argue, what we really dialogue, what we really present, what we uh, hear, what we reflect, what we see inside us with ourselves. And Basir, that Allah is watching us. So Sami and Basir is the two qualities that Allah has given to human beings also, that we are Sami and Basir, that Allah has made us, uh, give us the ability of hearing and, uh, he, uh, and what, uh, seeing. But our hearing and seeing is very limited, and Allah's hearing and seeing is infinite and unlimited. And then Allah is Mawla, Allah is guardian, protector, and Allah is the patron. He can anytime be with you and protect you from any kind of hardships and evils, and he can anytime save you from any troubles, and he can reach out and provide you the need that you have uh, and fulfill your needs and many other things and resources. And he is Nasir, he's the helper. He brings the Nasr, the help. So you see this Sami, Basir, Mawla, and Nasir, all of them are so correlated that shows the role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above human beings. The role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an infinite entity that yes, we have some of these attributes, but ours is so limited, Allah's abilities are infinite. And Allah is also Qawi and Aziz, mentioned in the previous verses uh, that we covered. Qawi and Aziz, mighty and powerful. Qawi, why? Because Allah mentions there uh, about the ability of power that human beings cannot even create as, uh, you know, an insect, a small insect, as a fly. And Allah has created the whole universe. You know, and also it's important to make a comment about the fly that some people may say, well, fly is nothing compared to advances in science and technology that human beings have made so far. Well, if we really think about it, if, if we really study the biology of a fly, that how those tiny organs inside the body of the fly works. Just think about the brain of the fly, think about the heart of the fly, think about the digestive system of the fly, that, you know, in, in micro level or nano level, that how they work. And they are so sophisticated, more than sophistication of a jumbo jet airplane that human beings have made, more than the satellite uh, that human beings have made, just one fly, one living creature is more complicated than that. So, but, so think about that power of Allah, the might of Allah, that not only the fly, he has created human beings, he has created all these other creatures and this entire universe. Imagine who Allah is, how powerful Allah is. And you guys are worshiping something or depending on something that has no power, no control. Some people worship Jesus. Jesus has no control, no role in this universe. He has left this world and he has departed and Allah will uh, bring him back and then he will not even know what happened between the time that I left and the time I came back. He cannot even hear the voices of anybody that people make a dua to him or anybody else, anything else that we worship, that people worship, you know, the statues, the others, you know, some people worship their uh, ascendants, 
and their grandfathers. Some people worship the saints. Some people worship the, uh, uh, you know, others uh, Peter and Moshe and others, you know. So if you worship them, think about it, how powerless they are compared to the powers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the words of power here, the names of powers of Allah, the names of attributes of Allah, they are all interrelated and interconnected to describe who Allah is and why people should turn to Allah and why people should worship Allah and why they should not worship other creatures who are not Qawi, who are not Aziz, who are not Basir, and who was not Mawla, who are not Nasir, like Allah is. So I hope, inshallah, I have tried to find some words here, some uh, reasons for that description. Another question that's coming here, should all of us do sajda after this session? Okay, about the sajda, this verse of 77, has been considered a verse of sajda by some scholars and have not been considered a verse of sajda by some other scholars. In fact, among the four schools of uh, thought, the four madhab in uh, uh, the uh, Sunni, uh, you know, uh, madhabs, uh, Hanbali and Shafi, the madhab of Hanbali and Shafi, they think that people should do sajda at the end of this verse. They say that this is one of the verses of sajda. But other scholars, other madhab like Hanafi scholars and uh, Maliki scholars, they say, no, you should not do uh, sajda in this verse. This is not a verse of sajda. Why? Those uh, scholars that they say that uh, there should be sajda because they say that, you know, look, it's an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you should offer ruku and sajda, as you should offer sajda. Uh, and also they uh, quote a hadith uh, that, uh, people should offer sajda and uh, 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 at the end of this verse, otherwise they should not read this verse. Um, and then the other scholars like uh, Hanafi scholars and uh, uh, Hanbali uh, Maliki scholars, uh, they say that, look, first of all, Allah here gives the order of ruku and sajda together. So this is not about sajda alone. This is basically about salat. This is uh, not about sajda alone. This is about salat. Other verses of sajda are just mentioning sajda. So this is referring to Salat, not the uh, Sajda in particular. And also they say that that Hadith that was reported by Ahmad, uh, you know, this was a weak Hadith and the reporter has a lot of uh, problems in his chain of narration. So uh, they say that uh, this verse actually, uh, uh, there's, uh, there shouldn't be a Sajda in this. But if people, um, you know, make a Sajda, Alhamdulillah, if they don't make a Sajda, no big deal. Uh, so uh, both of the opinions are uh, valid and they both have their uh, uh, good positions. Uh, and, uh, but other than this verse, on all other verses of sajda, scholars agree. There are 14 other places in Quran that people should make sajda and uh, there's no difference of opinion about those uh, verses, but only in this verse, uh, the scholars are divided whether this verse should be a verse of sajda or not. So those people who believe that uh, they should do sajda, alhamdulillah, they should do sajda at the end of this recitation, yes. And if they don't do sajda, they have not done anything wrong. Make a short dua that, Ya Allah, accept it from all of us and help us to reflect on these verses and help us to develop these great attributes that we should have. Ya Allah, help us to succeed in the tests of life. Help us to do what is required of us as believers, as the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, help us to be active in your path all the time and help us to understand your path and share your path with others and your teachings with others. Ya Allah, help us to be a witness on mankind and on people around us. And Ya Allah, help us to fulfill our duties in the best ways. Ya Allah, reward the brothers and sisters who have organized the, this webinar and reward everyone for their time, for their interest, for their uh, investment that they have done tonight. Ya Allah, uh, accept it from all of us. And thank you for this opportunity that you have given us. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah.